As a community, we build empathy, curiosity, joy, and connection when we share stories with you. Welcome to Storytellers Project, part of the USA Today Network. Hi, my name is Megan Finnerty, and I am coming to you from my living room in Phoenix, Arizona to say happy holidays and welcome to our holiday storytelling spectacular from the Storytellers Project on behalf of USA Today. I'm the founder and director of the project, and we so appreciate you sharing your evening with us. Tonight, we're joining five Americans from across the nation to create community. Since 2016, the Storytellers Project has brought more than 100 shows each year to communities across the country. But this is our last I hope virtual show. We did cancel our 2020 and 2021 seasons in real life and we have brought them to you truly from my living room and that of countless storytellers from across the country. And we are working to bring you hand-picked stories from amazing, relatable, thoughtful, charming people. We will be back in person next year in 17 cities. We are thrilled. We hope to welcome you safely in um, new places like uh, we're going to be in Austin next year, and um, Rochester is returning, and Phoenix is returning, Des Moines is returning. Also new next year is going to be Columbus and Palm Beach. So look for us in your community starting in February and March of next year. But for tonight and right now, I'm going to sit here and welcome our storytellers from across America. Liz Warren is my neighbor and colleague here in Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Liz. Hi, Megan. Hi. Hi, Chris Lundy is joining us from Philadelphia. Hi, Chris. Hi, Megan. Hi. Denise, hi, Denise Lopez is also here in Phoenix. Hi, Denise. Hi, Megan. Sean Wellington is joining us from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Hi, Sean. Hi. And Jasmine Crow is here from Atlanta. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for being with us, everybody. Well. We are so excited to bring you this show for, with all these storytellers who are going to be bringing relatable personal stories about their lives throughout the holidays. We're going to get right into it with our um, with Liz Warren, who is a friend of the project and who runs the South Mountain Community College Story, Storytelling Institute. So if you like her story, you can Google her later, uh, but you have to use the word storyteller. Otherwise, there is another Elizabeth Warren that might show up. <laughs> Liz? Um, oh, wait, hang on, you guys. I'm sorry, but doing this so often. Um, Joyce Moore, do you want to bring down our storytellers first? second. There we go. Sorry, everyone. We kind of left you up there for just a minute. Um, tonight is not a TED Talk. It's not Toastmasters. Liz is going to tell you a story that is really based on visiting. We invite you to open your heart and your mind to all of our storytellers, and we will start right now. Liz, take it away. Thank you, Megan. I learned to make turkey gravy from my father, and he learned to make it from his mother, Violet. Now, they were both much better cooks than I am, but my turkey gravy is just as good as theirs because it is theirs. I make it exactly the same way I saw them make it dozens of times and the way that my father taught me. Once the turkey is cooked, you take it out of the pan and then you put the pan on the stove to let the drippings get hot again. Then my dad would take a mason jar and he'd put about a half a cup of flour in it, put some hot water in, then he'd shake it and pour that through a strainer and then stir it all together until the gravy had cooked into a beautiful, fragrant, golden caramel brown. Absolutely delicious. I got to thinking about that gravy and how it came down through the generations to me. And I wondered, well, when did people first start putting flour into gravy? So I did some research. And I learned that, well, humans have always loved drippings. In fact, that's probably the reason that we even invented pots and pans, was so that we would have something to put under the roast on a spit so we could catch the drippings. But the first documented incorporation of flour into gravy, well, that was documented in Europe in the 1800s. And that is where and when I think my great, great, great grandmother, Antonia, probably learned to do it. She was born in Germany in 1916, 1816. And by 1840, she had gotten herself to Boston, where she met her future husband, who was also from Germany, 
just before he went to California for the gold rush. But before he left, I think she must have made that gravy for him. And it made an impression because after a few years, he sent her the passage and some gold jewelry, wedding jewelry that he'd mined himself, but he sent her the passage to sail all the way around South America up to Santa Cruz, California to join him there. And they got married. And my great, great, great grandmother Antonia taught her daughter to make the gravy. Who taught her daughter? Who taught my grandmother? Who taught my father? Who taught me? And in this way, the gravy was begotten in the land. So given that gravy is the savory golden lifeblood of our family, how could it be that I would ever, ever fail to make it? But I did. I'm astonished to tell you that I chose not to make it. Last year, November 2020, we were all still in lockdown. We weren't going to have our annual Thanksgiving potluck with 30 or 40 of our closest friends and relations. I thought the house is gonna feel so empty. What's the point in cooking? I just couldn't gear myself up for it. And it was in that frame of mind that I was seduced, seduced by ads from a local high-end grocery store. Let us prepare your Thanksgiving dinner, the ad said. Yes, yes, I thought, that's it. Thanksgiving is gonna be completely different, so let's do com something completely new. I will order the entire Thanksgiving dinner. Never done anything like that before, and I began, I began to get excited about it. I knew exactly where the pickup parking spots were in front of the grocery store, and I thought, this is how it's gonna be. I will drive into the pickup parking spot, I'll pop my trunk, I'll text them to let them know I'm there. They'll come rushing out with my warm turkey dinner, they'll put it in the truck, I'll rush home and my husband and I will have our feast. And this is the fantasy that I savored for the weeks leading up to Thanksgiving. I didn't really question any aspect of my fantasy until that very morning. I was supposed to pick it up at 11 o'clock. I thought maybe I should check and make sure I have the right number to text them when I get there so they can come rushing out with that nice, beautiful, warm turkey meal. But that's when I discovered that no, they were not going to bring that turkey out to me. I had to go into the store. Well, I hadn't been in a grocery store in nine months. But what was I gonna do? I had to get our feast. So I drove down at the appointed hour and went into the grocery store and it was packed. And it was a scene of anxious, swirling, chaos and tension. It was clear that most of those people in the grocery store had not been in a grocery store, just like me. They were driving their carts around randomly, looking off in every direction, glancing furtively at everyone. I myself stopped dead in the middle of the entryway trying to figure out what to do until someone asked me to move. And by asked me to move, I mean ran their cart into me. Well, I, I moved and that's when I noticed a guy in the booth over by the door and that was the guy I had to get my number from to let them know I was there to get my turkey. I got my number, he waved me off to a long line that was snaking through the islands where the prepared food used to be. And so I got in that line and we were socially distanced by our carts in front of us and the empty islands on either side and everyone was wearing, was wearing a mask because the grocery store required it. As I watched the people in front of me get their food, that's when my fantasy was finally completely burst. They were just bringing out shrink-wrapped turkeys and boxes of food. Sure, the, the grocery store had prepared the meal in that they had cooked it, but was far from ready to serve. Of course, how else could it be except in my overactive imagination? The line was slowly moving, and all of a sudden I heard someone say, Juan, Juan, but I couldn't quite tell if it was me, so I said, are you saying Juan? He said again, Juan, and I waved, 
And he came over holding a large turkey at shoulder height. And then he moved his hand over in front of my cart like a boom crane and then boom, he released 20 pounds of free range turkey into my cart. Clatter, clatter, clatter. The woman behind me squeaked in alarm. Then somebody else rolled up with a cart with everything else that I'd ordered. And I put that into my groceries cart, rolled out to the car, got it in the car, went home and unloaded it on the kitchen counter. And that's when I really knew how far from a real Thanksgiving dinner, at least according to me, this was going to be. It was the saddest approximation of a Thanksgiving dinner I had ever seen. The turkey was so, had evidently been vacuum packed and the plastic was so tight around it, I could barely pry it off. It was like a second skin. And when I sliced the turkey, the things that I sliced had the texture of a wetsuit, an old wetsuit. And the dressing was just cubes of baked bread that somebody put some celery and onion in. The mashed potatoes, the mashed potatoes were the very same ones that I get from Costco. I said, what the hell? The trusted high-end grocery store is reselling me Costco mashed potatoes? And yes, yes, they were. Now the green beans, the green beans actually weren't that bad, but the gravy, the gravy was an abomination. First, it was dark brown, dark brown. Turkey gravy is supposed to be a golden caramel brown. But second and worse, it tasted like nothing. It didn't taste like turkey. It didn't taste like beef. It didn't taste like chicken. It didn't taste like butter. It was just salty. Somebody had thickened up some water, put some salt in it and dyed it brown. Well, of course we ate it. What else were we, were we gonna do? But it was sadder than if we had just made grilled cheese sandwiches and called that Thanksgiving. That's what I knew. <laughs> the depth of the mistake I had made. The holidays, especially holidays that feature turkey, are not about doing something new, not for me anyway. They're about doing what we've always done and doing that on purpose and remembering the people and the places, bringing them back to life, at least for that day. So Christmas of 2020, I, I made the whole meal everything. And after I stirred the flour and water into the drippings and it was all cooked, I put a large serving spoon into that gravy, pulled it up to my mouth, blew a little to cool it off. And then the greatest moment of every Thanksgiving or turkey dinner, I put that spoon in my mouth. And just like that, my connection to my long line of gravy bearing ancestors sprang to life. I'll never miss an opportunity for as long as I can, for as long as I'm able to make turkey dinner and especially the gravy. It's not just the taste of the gravy, it's the power of the gravy to transport me through time, to open a portal through which I can travel in time. Back to 2019, the last time I made gravy for our family and friends. And then back to 1990, the last time I made gravy with my father. And then to 1978, when he taught me to do it, the first time I made gravy in my own home. And then to 1965, my grandmother made gravy in Skull Valley, Arizona. And then somehow through the power of gravy and the power of imagination, I can see all of those grandmothers before my own standing at their stoves, making the gravy. Lucy, Mary, Antonia. That gravy is proof that they lived of the adventures they took, the journeys they took, the mistakes they made, the people they loved, the lives they lived, without whom I wouldn't be here 
to put that spoon of gravy in my mouth. The proof of their existence and of mine. Oh, Liz, thank you so much for your story. Oh my gosh, and thank you for introducing us to your gravy making ancestors. Oh, thank you, Megan, my pleasure. Oh, thank you so much, so much. And I really appreciate your brooch. You look very festive. Oh, thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> Well, we are so excited to be, we're now into the show. And I hope that that story reminded you of, um, I mean, honestly, maybe like what is worth keeping from 2020 and your Christmas last year. And as Liz pointed out, what is worth throwing in the trash? Let's let's move forward with her gravy making optimism right into our next story. And I do want to point out, do you guys see these little tiny holly berries? Oh, they were just up a second ago. They're bringing me joy every time I see them. I hope that they make you guys happy too, because uh, they're flashing for a second. Thanks, Joe Smart. Um, that's our producer. His name is Joe Smart. He's great. Okay, on to our next storyteller. Jasmine Crow is here to tell us a story about a difference that she made that I think is especially relevant this time of year as all of us are looking to be, I think, a light in our communities. Jasmine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Megan. My name is Jasmine Crow. I am from Atlanta, Georgia. And I want to take you all back to a hot summer day in July of 2015. As I said in the kitchen, with my college roommate, and she just relocated to Atlanta, Georgia. Now, she relocated to Atlanta from New York City, and she wanted to chase what she called the American dream. Now, growing up in Harlem, she never had a backyard to play in. She never rode the school bus to school. But as a new mother and a newlywed, she wanted to give her son a life she never knew. And working in, in New York, she was a creative artist. She was touring the world with the likes of Alicia Keys, Paula Abdul, Zendaya, working on sets like Good Morning America. And she thought, surely I can move to Atlanta. It's the number two filming and Hollywood destination. And I will be able to pick right back up, keep my career going, but give my kids a life I never had. And so she and her husband voyaged here. And one summer I visited their home and she and I sat in her kitchen catching up and we're laughing and, you know, thanking God that there was no social media when we were in college and the terrible outfits that we used to wear, just having a really good conversation. And she says, do you want a glass of water? And I said, sure. And she opens her refrigerator door and I could immediately see from the front to the back. And this is pre-Zoom, right? So we don't know what our faces look like when we're having conversations with other people. And so to this day, I don't know what my face read, but she turned around and she's standing there and she's pregnant with her second child, a young daughter, and she burst into tears. And she says, Jasmine, I know what you're thinking. I always try and keep meals and snacks in the house, but often we don't have the money to. We're trying to pay our rent, trying to pay our bills. I'm not working. We're on one income and, then we're, and it's hard. And I call that day the day that I saw the light because all I could remember was this bright light shining in my eyes from this empty refrigerator of my friend who didn't fit the face of what I knew hunger to be. Now, I want to let you all know that I've been vested in this fight for over a decade. I had started feeding people that were experiencing homelessness and hunger, often living unsheltered on the streets or living in low-income senior high-rises in 2013. I had relocated to Atlanta from Phoenix, Arizona. And as I was driving through downtown, I saw hundreds of people experiencing homelessness. And something in that moment moved me. It pulled on my heartstrings and I thought I've got to do something. I'm making Atlanta home. I care about people. I want to make a difference in this world. I'm going to do something. And so I went home, I posted on Facebook and I said, I'm creating this initiative called Sunday Soul. And every Sunday, I'm going to go downtown. I'm going to feed on the streets. It's going to be a mixture of old school music. So I want you guys to think about the Temptations and the OJs and Jackson 5 and Al Green, you know, love and happiness. And I would pair it with like a good Sunday dinner. So that kind of Sunday meal you have after church. And my first meal ever was just a spaghetti dinner, corn on the cob, garlic bread, a salad. And I had this small little beets pill, not as loud as I thought outside, but people rejoiced and they had such a good time that it made me know that what I was doing mattered. And what took me back to that moment with my friend is that 
for many months, she had been volunteering with me out there, feeding people every Sunday, helping me cook. But at the same time, she herself was experiencing hunger. And I think what I want everybody to realize is that so often, whether we know it or not, people are going through things. You can know someone that is experiencing hunger, but often pride keeps them from telling you. And what was so peculiar to me is that my friend's story was so different. She was college educated. She was married. She had led a successful career, traveled the world. She just was experiencing something that one out of six people in this country experience, and that's hunger. And it's a state. It's something that people don't live in for a long time, but they can experience it. And her story moved me to start thinking that I've got to solve hunger differently, that it's not enough just to feed on the streets one Sunday, one day out of the week. I could really make a difference. And I didn't know how. But at the same time, I continue to do the work. And a few months later, in February of 2016, a video of one of my pop-up restaurants went viral on Facebook. And I woke up one morning to millions of views, thousands of friend requests and comments. And one night I'm reading through the comments and amongst the praise, there's one reoccurring question that people keep asking me. This is so amazing. Which restaurants donated the food? And I was partly flattered because I was like, wow, like I must be an amazing cook. People think this is restaurant quality food. This is something I'm cooking in my home. But it also made me think like, wow, how much easier my life would be if I could get this food donated. To give you some perspective of how hard it used to be to feed three to 500 people every week, I would start looking at the circulars on Wednesday. I would begin shopping on Thursday. I would lay out all of the pans of food that I was gonna make on Friday. I would start cooking on Saturday, wake up really, really early Sunday morning, finish my side items, load everything up into my car, drive downtown where volunteers would meet me to serve it, come home, and I'd have one heck of a kitchen to clean up. And I was doing that on a consistent basis, taking five and ten dollar donations, you know, getting items price match. I often joke that I'm the reason Walmart doesn't price match anymore, right? When I was doing this and getting really good at making chicken and pasta and stretching $300 to probably feed up to 500 people. And I thought, let's get this food donated. And like so many people, I went to my search engine and I said, you know, what happens to excess food at the end of the night? And lo and behold, I run into I fall into a rabbit hole about food waste. And I learned that in the United States, one of the richest countries on this planet, we were wasting 40% of all the food that we produce every single year. And this was about 2% of GDP, nearly $220 billion wasted on food that never gets eaten, while at the same time, people like my friend and many people like her having to make critical decisions every month, am I gonna pay for food or am I gonna pay for bills, existed. And I became upset and I started thinking to myself, why is this happening? Why am I having to struggle to feed people on the streets that don't know where their next meal is coming from? Why is my friend whose husband is working a full-time job and she's pregnant and they have a young son and they're struggling, why don't they just have access to this food that keeps going to waste? Why is this happening? And at the same time, we were seeing the emergence of the food delivery apps. So I would get those referral codes from my friends. This is the early days of DoorDash and Grubhub and Uber Eats. Use this code, save $10 off your first meal. And I started to think, wow, there is so much technology that is being built to get food to people that have, but no one was building for the have-nots. No one was building for the people that didn't know where their next meal was coming from. The nearly 50 million people that are going to go to bed hungry tonight, wake up tomorrow morning not knowing when and where their next meal is coming from, the food insecure. And I thought, maybe I could do something. Maybe I could solve this problem. And now I'm not a technical person. I you know, have my apps I may play with, but trust and believe, I had no idea how I was gonna build this. I remember being so naive and thinking it's gotta be as simple as maybe getting a website built. It's gonna cost me a couple hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred or a thousand dollars. Definitely, um, I found out really quickly, it cost me in fact, a couple hundred thousand dollars to build this vision. And I started to go around and talk to people and say, hey, I've got this idea. I want to build an app. I want to solve hunger. I want to reduce food waste. And people would say things to me like, oh, you're crazy. No one's ever going to pay for that. You're, you know, no one's going to do that. No one's going to donate their food. What if someone gets sick, they'll get sued. And I started listening to all these objections and I would go and try and solve for them. And I would learn about laws that actually made it 
not only easy and liability protective for businesses to donate their food, but actually enhancements that allow them to get tax deductions and save money and, and really solve this problem. But for so often, I let people tell me that my idea wasn't good enough. And I continued to think about that light. And I thought about my friend that day and I thought, what do I have to lose? I'm trying to solve hunger. I'm trying to reduce food waste. I'm trying to make people's lives better. This is certainly better than a social media app, a dating app, all the other things that we invest in technology. What do I have to lose? And so I went to a local technical college in my city of Atlanta and I got a clickable prototype built. And I used that prototype for an entire year in 2017 to enter pitch competitions using the prize money to build the technology. And in 2018, I got that technology to market and I launched a company called Gooder. Our mission is to feed more and waste less. And I went on this journey of trying to get more people to join me in this fight. And soon I did. I began to get customers like the Atlanta airport and you know the Georgia Royal Congress Center. I started to work with partners like the NBA and the NFL. And I started to see that my idea was working. And I learned that the only limiting factor in making me not do this earlier was the fact that I allowed people's negative thoughts and the beliefs of things that they think that they couldn't do to shape my experience. And I learned that that's a critical thing that no one should ever do. I am so proud to say that the app and the company is working and it's live. We now have over 50 employees. We've provided well over 30 million meals to people in need. In September, we launched our first free in-school grocery store, serving nearly 90 families and students on a weekly basis who now have access to food right where they are, eliminating food deserts, bringing dignity and quality to people. And more importantly, I'm proud to say that my friend today is thriving. She's back working in the film and TV industry, king sets. She's leading an amazing life. That American dream that she came to Atlanta to chase now exists for her. The reality is that everybody can go through periods of struggle. And what our, point, what our purpose here in life is to lend a helping hand, do what we can to serve our fellow neighbors, our friends, our family members, to do it with dignity, to allow them to have the pride, but also let them know that it's going to be okay, that we can get through this. So despite whatever you may be going through, your dreams are valid. If you work on them, if you persevere through them, you can do amazing things like feeding people and ending hunger. Thank you. I'm going to miss her so much. I sound too much like a fan going. And then we're just here tonight. Watch. Thank you so much. And then like a robot just. Can you hear? Hi, Jasmine. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks so much, Megan. Awesome. Hello. Thank you. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> My ear pods. Anyway, um, Jasmine, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your story. Thank you for waiting a second also. But I really want to honor, um, it was such a gift to hear your story because you model such pro-social behavior about how you saw a need, you found a way to fill it, you acted with grace and compassion, and truly now you're creating so much more exponential opportunity for people to also fill that need with your um, B Corp Gooder. So we're really grateful to have you tonight. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Well, everyone, if you want to learn more about Jasmine and her mission, um, we're putting things in the comments, depending on what platform you're watching us on right now. Um, but you can also Google it. It's G-O-O-D-R. And um, we're really grateful to her because um, 
I feel like this time of year, most of us are really aware of our blessings. And often we are looking for places to give back to somebody we can be generous with and think of others in their need. And Jasmine's story is such a shining example of seeing a need in your own circle, meeting that need, and then growing the impact of your observation. So truly such a blessing of a story to hear right now. Would also like, um, so Jasmine, thank you for your story, but also thank you for your good work. Uh, also, if you Google her, we're proud of her. She has a TED Talk, and so that's fabulous. Anyway, um, we also want to take a second to say thank you to our sponsor who stuck with us through the pandemic, one of our sponsors. I mean, we have several who join us during the season. Fairytale Brownies is a real company based here in Phoenix, Arizona, and they are hoping that you will think of them during this busy season when you need to think of the perfect gift to give or a thank you present for maybe after the holidays. They want you to know that you can give the gift of a joyful ending to every story and certainly a fairy tale ending to any story. If you visit them at brownies.com, they've got everything from like blondies, brownies, cookies, the whole nine yards, everything you're thinking about eating this time of year. And they're baked with premium ingredients by real people right here in Phoenix, Arizona. And you can actually still ship in time for the holidays because this, this little note was written exactly for tonight's show. So if you visit them at brownies.com, you can learn more about what they do and you can make it ship in time for Christmas right now. If you check out the chat, you also can, um, you can, there's a little link there that you can click on to receive a discount on a future purchase or um, give away a fairy tale dozen to two winners. So you can win a dozen brownies right here. We'd love to have you. Um, sorry about that. We'd love to have you join us with that. It is now my opportunity to bring up Chris Lundy, who is coming to us from Philadelphia with a holiday story of his own. Thanks, Megan. So if you have a good year, you will have a great Christmas. This was the rule growing up in my house. Now we had a small family. It was just my mother, my big sister and me, but we took Christmas very, very seriously. And I had a great year. So I was in high school. Uh, I was on the honor roll. I was captain of the football team. I was in ROTC. I was homecoming king. I had an amazing year. So in, in Christmas terms, I was expecting a Ferrari or maybe something Ferrari adjacent. I wasn't trying to be too picky. And so, the morning of Christmas, we're out in the living room by the Christmas tree, and I noticed that there's just one gift with my name on it. Now, I'm a Christmas veteran, so I know that it's not about the quantity of gifts, but it's about the quality. This one gift could be the gift of all gifts, and I could love it. So I'm looking at it, and you know, I, I, I take it. It's a flat box. I shake it a little bit. And I just can't figure out what's inside, but I'm really, really excited. The anticipation is killing me. So I tear into this box and I, and I open it and I pull out a t-shirt. It, it was just a t-shirt. It was white. Uh, on the front of it, there was a lion um, and it wasn't a name brand lion like a Nike or Jordan lion. It was just a stupid lion. And the lion was laying out in front of some landscape. Um, the t-shirt was like two sizes too big, which didn't matter anyway, because I wouldn't be caught dead wearing this shirt. This t-shirt was like, uh, it's the shirt that you get when you open a free checking account. That's what it was. It was the type of shirt that they throw out during the halftime at a football game. You know, everybody has a, a old raggedy shirt that you repurpose as a wash rag for like your car or maybe a counter or something like that. This shirt immediately qualified as the wash rag shirt. Fresh out the box, wash rag t-shirt. That's how bad it was. This shirt was trash. Now, I was raised to be thankful and show gratitude to any gift that I received, no matter how big, no matter how small, just to show appreciation, but not this time, man. I had an amazing year and I wasn't going for it this time. I'm thinking to myself, why is this my Christmas gift? And so I said to my mother, why is this my Christmas gift? And she looked really disappointed. And she explained to me that things were tight. Like money was tight. Like we were in a pretty bad situation financially and she couldn't afford to give me the types of gifts that she felt I deserved that Christmas. I felt really guilty. I felt terrible for even bringing it up. Um, but, you know, we talked about it 
and we said that the next year, Christmas, we'll be back. It'll be all good. We'll get great gifts. And it felt good. It, it, you know, we, we reassured each other that it was all right and we'll get them next year. Well, later that year, the following summer, um, my mother had a uh, brain aneurysm, um, subarachnoid brain hemorrhage. I'll never, I'll never forget that word. I never heard it before, but I'll never forget it. And uh, she went to sleep and she did not wake up. My mother passed away that, that summer and everything changed. The whole world was just upside down. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, when you're underage and you uh, don't have a parent or a guardian, you're considered a ward of the state, a ward. It's so upside down. And there was so much that we didn't know. You know, we didn't know that 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 Christmas was the last Christmas that we would ever have together. Um, you know, that that T-shirt, we didn't know that that would be the last Christmas gift that my mother ever gave to me. Um, you know, that that T-shirt. I love that T-shirt. You know, it's 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 white. And so it looks real crisp and, and, and clean, fresh out the wash. Um, it's got this lion on the front of it, this, this brave looking lion that's sitting out in front of this African landscape. It's gotta be the Serengeti, it's gorgeous. And the shirt is really, really big, which is perfect for sleeping in or, or, or cuddling up in when you, when you need comfort. I love that shirt. You know, people, people sometimes ask, hey, if, you're, if your house was on fire and you can only save one thing, you know, it's a blaze going on, you only had time to save one item, what would it be? Well, for me, for me, it would be that t-shirt, you know, no question. I love that shirt. It's, uh, it's, it's the best Christmas gift I've ever got. Thank you. Oh, Chris, thank you so much for your story. Thank you for telling us about your mom. Can you thank tell you. us her name? Can you tell us her full name? Yeah, Margaret, Margaret Lundy. Okay. Thanks for asking. God bless, God bless Margaret. Thank you for introducing <laughs> us to her tonight. Oh, um, I just need a second after Chris's story because I always feel so convicted that I'm one of those people that's maybe not always as grateful as I should be for all the nice gifts that I get. And um, I so appreciate him telling that story because, um, you know, it really isn't the gift, right? It's the thought that the giver put into it. And so um, anyway, it's the holiday season. I'm just crying at a national television show. Thanks so much for joining us. But Chris, God bless your mom. And thank you so much for telling us that story. I would like to bring up our next storyteller who has a totally different energy and her story deserves a big deep breath. And now we're going to come here, Denise Lopez, who also has a story about holiday memories and family members. So Denise, take it away. Thanks, Megan. My sophomore year of college, I moved into my first apartment. I had worked extra jobs that summer to make sure all the rooms were furnished but it wasn't as fulfilling as I thought it would be. As the months passed by that fall semester, I started to regret being in such a hurry to grow up. Being an adult was hard, and at times it felt overwhelming. As Christmas grew closer, I told myself, I should probably get at least a few decorations for my apartment. But I was working and going to school full time, so it seemed easier to make excuses. I figured if anyone asked me why I didn't have decorations that year, I would just say I didn't have the storage space. But realistically, I could have fit a few tubs in the closet out of my patio. I don't know why, but I was having such a hard time getting into the Christmas spirit. And I had always loved Christmas when I was growing up. As a little girl, I had imagined that Christmas decorations would be a major necessity for my home. You know, if I had to put household items in order of importance, it would be pots and pans, bathroom towels, tree topper. During college, my grandparents and I would meet for dinner every Tuesday night. Thanksgiving had just passed and I knew they were gonna ask me if I had decorated yet. When it came to the holidays, 
my Nana needed very little encouragement to celebrate. My Tata, he's more of a along for the ride kind of guy. But either way, I knew I was going to get grilled. So, have you decorated your apartment yet, my Nana asked? Do you need us to help you go get a tree? Trying hard not to look her in the eye, I said, I'm not getting a tree this year. I can't afford it. And besides, I'll be with you on Christmas. I don't need to decorate my place too. I thought for sure she would argue with me. She didn't. Instead, they both said in unison, who are you right now? Which somehow felt so much worse. Trying to stand my ground, I told them it feels silly to decorate just for me. And without skipping a beat, my Nana told me, we'll be by this weekend to take you shopping and to go get a treat. No buts about it. When I went home that night, I thought about what they'd said. And they were right. It wasn't me. I had seemed to have forgotten everything they taught me. See, when I was a little girl, my mom and I lived with my grandparents. And for me, they made Christmas the most magical time of the year. I was the only child and only grandchild for 16 years, which meant, yes, I was spoiled. But my Nana also made sure to show me how we could make Christmas special for the people that we loved. I always knew it was going to take us from the day after Thanksgiving up until Christmas Eve to get everything just right. Presents had to be tied up in beautiful bows. Baking was a multi-day adventure for my tiny apron would be covered in flour and my belly was full of all the treats she let me sample. But Christmas was never complete without the decorations. And it was never enough to simply decorate our house. We had to pick themes each year. I can still hear my Nana say, what are we feeling this year, Miha? Is it snowmen? Angels? Oh, I know, Southwestern chili peppers. Look at the chili lights I found. I still can't believe we actually did that one, but we are from Arizona after all. I'm not sure how to best convey to you the amount of decorations we had, but let's just say there were multiple sheds in our backyard. That following weekend, my mom and my Nana came and picked me up to go shopping for decorations. Now, I thought we would go to maybe Target or Mervyn's, but they took me to Robinson's May. My mom was a single mom when I was growing up, so Robinson's May still felt like an expensive department store to me. I remember standing in the middle of the most elegant holiday displays, thinking, I can't afford these decorations, and was a little confused as to why they brought me there. My Nana must have seen the look of worry on my face because she told me, you should pick whatever you want. It's your first Christmas in your first apartment. It has to be special. I wanted to let myself indulge, but I couldn't help but feel guilty. They didn't understand I had to give up my much needed weekend nannying job just to go shopping with them. And Christmas didn't feel as carefree as it did when I was a little girl. After a lot of compromise, we picked a few items and headed back to my apartment where my thought that was waiting to take us to get a tree. At that time, I lived on the second floor of the apartment complex. So I've been thinking we were going to get a small tree, you know, maybe four foot tops. As I'm explaining my plan to them, it becomes clear my Nana wants no part of it. We can talk about that at the tree lot, she said, which was her polite way of saying it's never going to happen. At the lot, we must have had my thought that open up about a dozen or so trees. I kept pushing for a small tree, mostly hoping they would let me chip in for some of the expenses. But when I saw the look of joy on their faces, I couldn't bring myself to break their hearts. When we got back to my apartment, my poor thought that I had to haul this six and a half foot tall noble fir all the way up my stairs and all the way across my apartment, where we eventually set it up in the corner near my sliding glass doors. They helped me decorate it with the navy blue and silver bulbs, white twinkling lights, and star-shaped tree topper that I had gotten earlier in the day. When we were all done, my Nana turned to me and asked, so what do you think? It's perfect, I told her. After they'd gone home, I sat on my couch just admiring my tree. And it occurred to me that while Christmas is about the joy that we can bring to others, 
that doesn't mean we can't also put ourselves on that list. Now that I'm a parent, looking back, I realize to our parents and grandparents even, we will always be their little ones. And I couldn't deny that they had given me the missing piece in my home I hadn't even realized was missing. When Christmas was over that year, I could comfortably fit all of my decorations in two large Rubbermaid tubs, which of course was not nearly enough by my Nana's standards. But those tubs have moved with me to every place I've ever lived. After my Nana passed away, I was lucky enough to inherit so many of those decorations I adored as a little girl. Since then, my kids and I have taken pride in growing our Christmas collection. In our 18 by 20 foot storage shed, yes, I do have a shed. I would say the majority is Christmas decorations. We have tubs for all of our ornaments, tubs for the Santa Village, and now, thanks to my toddler, a tub of decorations that can't easily be broken. Now, every year as we lug those giant boxes from the storage shed to the living room, I remember the person who started it all, my Nana Margie. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for your story. We are so lucky to have it. That was beautiful. Can you hear me okay? Oh, no. I heard you, Megan. Oh, can, hi, I don't know if she, you could hear me. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, you just, there was a little bit of a lag. I was just thanking you and saying thank you so, so much for telling us about your Nana and all of your Christmas, um, your Christmas traditions. And I just wanted to honor that like, um, so many of us, I think, treasure the holiday ornaments that get passed down from year to year to year to year. And so I yes. hope, right, I hope that so many of our, our listeners and viewers right now were thinking about their ornaments, the ones they love, the people who they love, that gave them to them, and especially those unbreakable ones, which, right, why don't we pass those down more? A necessity. <laughs> A necessity for toddlers. Yes, we have, so I have four generations of ornaments on my tree from my great grandparents down. And my kids know that when they uh, move on and have their own homes that they can take ornaments and different parts of the decorations and start their own collection. Denise, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your family's traditions with ours. And I hope reminding all of us of some of our own favorite traditions too. My pleasure. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. We are going to close out our show tonight with our final storyteller who we're really excited. Sean is coming to us from Chapel Hill and he's going to tell us a little bit of, you know, a storytelling, a story, um, I think that's about like one of the other sides of the holidays. So Chris, sorry, not Chris, you're Sean. Bring us home. Sorry about that. Thanks, Megan. Mm -hmm. It's the fall of 2020. I'm home making some dinner in my little kitchen. I'm trying to go vegan, so it's nothing too fancy. And I'm alone, which I'm used to. I've gotten used to being alone. It's been like this for several years. And usually that's okay. But sometimes it gets the best of me. And this is one of those times. It's Thanksgiving. And I'm alone, which is a first. And I'm having a kind of a tough time. And I pick up the phone to call somebody. I'm looking through my contacts, family, and friends. I don't want to feel this way. But I don't dial anyone. They're probably doing their own Thanksgiving thing anyway, or maybe they're preparing their own dinners or watching a football game together, setting the table. And I don't think I want to hear any of that right now. And I certainly don't want to talk about what I'm up to. I need to leave. I need to get out of my home. So I just stop making dinner. I grab my keys. I lock up. I go for a drive. I'm thinking that might help because sometimes driving helps. I don't know exactly where I'm going. But within a few blocks, I realize I'm now alone in my little car. Nothing has really changed. This is not going to work. So I look for something or somewhere and I see these lights, it's this giant parking lot. It's almost empty. Most of the stores are closed, but one is open. And I park my car, I put my mask on. Before I get out, 
I sit for a few moments. I'm looking in the rear view mirror at this now middle-aged man, wondering how I got here. The lights inside Walmart are bright. This place is so big, but it's quiet. And there are some people here, mostly employees. They've got their red vests. There's a few other people walking around. Maybe they're like me. I don't know. I walk around. I don't really need anything, but I'm going up and down the aisles. I do not like Walmart. I've never been here for Thanksgiving, but until this year, I'd never been alone. I'd always been with family or friends. Even after my folks split, when I was a real little kid or when I got older and I moved around some, or after I fell out of one side of my family, and then not long after that, the other side, I was always with family or friends, or even a few times friends of friends. I always had an invitation. I wasn't alone until 2020. It's not just because of COVID. Nobody's asked me over. So I walk up and down those aisles. There's so much stuff and I'm not feeling any better. But then I see this sign, this bright neon sign. It says for sale socks. There's this big box of socks, like the tube socks with the different color stripes. I don't need socks. What I do need is to not feel this way, to not feel so alone. So I have an idea. It's cold outside, colder than usual here in North Carolina. And I've got my car. So I, I say, why don't I just get a bunch of these socks and give them out to people who might need them? I mean, People need socks. I don't usually do this kind of thing. I could. I don't. I'm desperate. There's no one in line to pay. I talk for a few moments with the clerk, but she's not really wanting to talk to me. So I buy the socks. I go out to my car and I start driving around my neighborhood. And I keep thinking about the other people in the store. Like, why are they there on Thanksgiving? And then I talk to people on the street. I think they're homeless. I ask them if they need socks. Some don't, some do, and they take a pair or maybe two. And there's a lot of people around, more than I thought. I meet this woman. She tells me that she just left a shelter because it felt unsafe. And we talk some more. She left her husband who hit her. She came to stay with a friend, but it didn't work out. I don't really know how to end the conversation. I'm not sure if I want the conversation to end. And she thanks me. And I say, yeah, you know, stay warm and stay safe, which makes sense to say that stuff, but it feels weird. Stay warm. I mean, then I meet this guy. He's got one leg. He's got these crutches. And he, he says he lost his leg in Iraq. He says he's been standing on the corner for a couple of years. He's got this sign. It says, I'm a vet and I'm hungry. We talk more. He makes a joke about not needing a pair of socks because he only has one leg. And we both laugh a little. And then he thanks me. I know that all of this is a bribe. I don't know what they need, probably more than socks. But what I need is to not feel so alone. And after I talk with her and then him, I wonder who's helping who more. And I drive to a different neighborhood. And I'm thinking about how close I have been to being exactly where they are. And if not for my family, both sides, the ones that now seem fractured beyond repair, and even a few friends whose lives are now so different than mine, and none of them I wanna to talk to right now. If not for them, I'd probably be exactly where they are. I go to another parking lot not too far away and I see a family. Well, it looks like a family. I, I get out of my car, I walk, I get closer, I've got some socks. I see this boy, he's holding a girl's hand and she's smiling a little bit, she's adorable. And I see this woman and she's holding a man's hand. She's kind of looking away. The man shakes my hand and he thanks me for the socks. Yeah, of course, of course. We talk for a little bit. I could tell they're not from around here. I can see my breath. They're still holding hands. And I'm wondering how they might have gotten here, 
how something like this happens. I imagine they had a good life back home and something happened and, and they didn't have any help or maybe someone got sick and they lost a job and they ended up here. Somehow they ended up here in North Carolina, maybe not homeless at first, but then something else happened and they had no one, but they had each other, but that wasn't enough. And here they are. I've got no more socks. I say goodbye and I drive away and my phone and all its contacts are on the passenger seat. And I look in the rear view mirror and I'm still wondering how I got here. And I can see them, the family. They have something I don't have, still holding hands. And I know that I have something that they don't have, at least not right now. It's not fancy, but it's something. And I get home and it's warm and safe and I finish making my vegan holiday dinner. And before I eat, I do something that I rarely do. I give thanks. Thank you. Sean, thank you so much for your story. And thank you for your thoughtfulness. It is such a delicate story and it is so carefully told. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. To, truly, I um, I know that so many people, um, the holidays are a complicated time. We've been hosting a holiday storytelling show for this is um, our 11th in the history of the project. Um, and I want to honor Chris's story as the, or sorry, it's Sean. I keep saying Chris. I'm really sorry. Sean's story is the last story of our evening because I know the holidays are always a complicated time of year. Once we held a storytelling event in person and it just turned out that that year all the stories were pretty funny and breezy. We actually got criticism that none of the stories talked about the hard parts of the holidays. And so um, I'm grateful that tonight's show had such a mix of sentiments and um, observations about how all of us experience the holiday season. With that, it would be a joy to bring up all of our storytellers tonight so that you can recognize them and say thank you real quick with the internet emotions that come out. Thanks so much to all of our storytellers. We're giving everybody a tiny little internet claps. Hopefully Liz and Jasmine are still with us, but um, you know, maybe they're maybe they're not. Maybe we're having some technical difficulties. Um, I did want to say also um, to our storytellers tonight, so many people left so many comments on our YouTube channel that were incredibly generous. People have said they were going to invest in Kleenex. Um, we're also, um, you know, just so many <laughs> shout outs, people really appreciating your stories tonight. So thank you all uh, for our storytellers. I would also like to thank our audience tonight for joining us and rounding out now truly two years of storytelling shows live from my couch. Um, we hope that if you've liked these remote or these virtual nights, you will join us in person next year at one of our 17 community-based storytelling events led by our journalists across the USA Today network. With that, we hope you have a very Merry Christmas, spectacular new year. There's so much to look forward to in 2022. Thank you again to tonight's storytellers and to all of our audience members.